this is going to be part three of the magnetism overview and in this part I'm going to talk about how moving charges or currents um, create magnetic fields. I'm not going to do any explicit examples in this video to keep it, uh, keep it short. I'm going to do examples elsewhere. So I suspect um, you will want to look at some examples, especially after being exposed to the Biot-Savart rule or the Biot-Savart law, because it, it's rather sort of complicated looking when you first meet it, um, and it helps to just actually work through a couple of examples. Um, but we'll get there. Let me start actually with another uh, case. Let's say I've got a very simple wire, and the wire goes straight up like this. So the current, the I current, is going upwards. So you know, there maybe it's a battery somewhere, who cares, right? There's an electric current going upwards to the wire. Because literally it means the electrons are moving down, but we can imagine positive charges going up. Then the magnetic field that creates, and we can for now just pretend this is sort of an experimentally established fact, which I mean it is, um, it, it looks like this. So they sort of curl around the wire. Um, and which way do they curl? Do they curl like this way around or the other way around? Um, that's given by the, so I'm going to call it the curly right hand rule. And what it is, is you take your fingers, your right hand, so that's crucial, right? Right hand rule. And your thumb, you curl it like this, and your thumb points in the direction of the, the current, and then your fingers, they sort of wrap around. You can imagine they, they were longer, they sort of wrap around your whole hand a couple of times, right? Um, but the way they're pointing, that's the direction of the field as you go around. So one thing about magnetism is that you always have to visualize everything in 3D, which can be hard. So you see me sort of painstakingly trying to draw those 3D drawings. Um, let's try to apply this. So uh, if the current goes up the up the page, right, I'm with my thumb in this direction, and then on the left of it, my fingers are pointing towards the camera, so, so the, the field there is coming towards us, but on the other side, it's kind of hard for me to do, um, the thumb points up and the fingers are pointing inwards, so there the field goes goes in. Um, so I'm going to call it the curly right hand rule. Um, I, I'm not sure what the book calls it, it might have some different name for it, but there will be a different right hand rule later that's not curly, so we have to make sure to distinguish between the two. The strength of the magnetic field in this case actually f um, is given by this equation here. I'm just going to state it right now. Um, it's mu naught, which is a constant, the constant, a little bit like the electric constant or the the epsilon naught you know from electrostatics, um, times the current divided by two pi. Okay, you know two pi is times r. The, the r is the distance from the the wire. So. Um, crucially, what you see, this goes as 1 over r, which means that if I double the distance, right, I'm going to half this magnetic field strength. The further I get away from the wire, the weaker the field gets. Um, double the distance, half the field strength. Triple the distance, a third of the field strength, and so on. Um, later on, you'll be able to prove this, um, if you work through it, from the, the Biot-Savart law, which gives us the... Um, the magnetic field is like a single moving charge. So we can kind of pretend we're building this, wi this wire from a large number of small moving charges, and that's what we're going to get back. There's also a better method, much by better I mean much more convenient, shorter method, um, and that is using Ampere's law. I'm going to talk about that somewhere else. So if you try to draw this, say, in 2D, right, it's hard to draw stuff in 3D to make it unambiguous, so in magnetism, we have this kind of method of drawing stuff in 2D, where we have symbols to, to mean the fields coming out of the page are going into the page. If my current's up, and I want to have the field go into the page, I make little crosses. And the closer they are together, the stronger the field. So it's stronger here than, say, over here, where I've drawn them further apart. And if the field comes towards us, like out of the page, like my pen's pointing right now towards the camera, upwards, right, I have to little dots. Now I always have trouble remembering which is which. Like every time I come back to magnetism I can't remember. Um, one time one of my students gave me this, this rather genius idea of saying look just pretend um, it's an 
an arrow, you're shooting an arrow, like from a bow, right? What do you see? Do you see the point coming towards you, or do you see the sort of cross tail feathers? Anyway, that might work for you. Um, it's worked for me surprisingly well. Um, so I'm no longer standing there in, in class teaching, getting horribly confused by which way is which, even though it's just a 50-50, right? Um, so crosses into the page, dots coming out of the page. Sometimes, what I might add just um, in the corner here, sometimes you want to have the current come out of the page. In this case, I do the same thing, but I put a circle around it. This is the current comes out of the page, out of the page. And if I do this with a circle, it means the current is into the page. So in this case, I just want the current to be like pointing straight down. It's like a wire that's vertically on my desk, pointing straight down. Here, out of the current going straight down. Here, it's a vertical wire, but the current's coming straight up, right? Um, if I drew it this way, let me just do this. Let's say I'm looking at this from above, so then the current be coming towards me like this. This would be my wire. Then the magnetic field by the hand rule, right? So thumb is the direction of the current, points up, so it's, it's anti-clockwise, counter-clockwise. The field would look something like this from, from above. Right, hopefully it matches what I try to draw in 3D there. Now, it might be, of course, that you have a different shape of wire. Um, one simple example you can think of is a loop. Now, of course, to have a current in a loop, you probably want to put a little battery somewhere, or maybe a little cable goes off to the side. But we don't care, right? Whatever caused it, there's a, there's a current in this, in this loop. And I tried to sort of draw it again in 3D. It's really hard to do. And I'll draw it a bit thicker. What's going to be the front? Right? And if you do that, um, you get a, a magnetic field that looks something like this. Again, you could, you could sort of prove this by imagining what does this little tiny bit of wire do? What does this bit of wire do? What does this bit of wire do? And we add them all up. And mathematically, we do it by integration. And the individual contribution from each, each little field, each little chunk of wire, would be given by the bio Savalo, which I'm going to come to. Right? But for now, let's just work with the result. Right? The result is, look, this is the field we get. We can do an experiment here. We can you know, move a compass needle around and see what happens. Um, sometimes we talk about a coil. And a coil, all a coil is, is just the same thing, but wrapping around multiple times. Right? And that just means we're essentially going to, if I wrap around twice, it's like I have twice the current. Now, what's the mag magnetic field strength there? If you're right in the center, and that's often important, um, you get the same mu naught over 2, and then the number of turns n times the current over the radius. The 2D version, looking at it like from, in this case, from the right, like if I, if I stand over here and look at the, at the, um, I guess stand right here, and I look to the left, I look at the coil, it will look, look like this, and again, the field will be coming towards me in the middle and pointing away from me um, around it as it curves, it kind of curves around like this. Maybe I could add just a couple of little ones sort of like there. Right, that's a curve, curve around like this. And of course, again, you have to imagine this whole thing in 3D, so right close to us, there's also a little one that curves sort of around like this. Um, if you draw those field lines, it kind of looks a bit like a, a bit like a donut shape, if you know what I mean. Like they always go around the wire. Um, not sure if that helps at all. See if you can visualize this in 3D, right? Um, if, you, if you want to know the magnetic field somewhere out here, and I call this the z-axis, say here, certain distance z from the center, then the expression you get is this one here. And again, you can do this by, calculate this by integration. Um, a fun little exercise to actually work through it. And the answer you get is this number of coils again times the current. Okay, that makes sense. And then the radius squared over z squared plus r squared. So the, the distance, this distance squared over this distance squared to three halves. Um, now what you can check is that if z equals zero, I'm going to get back this one, right? Because z equals zero is the center point. 
Now, what I want to draw attention to here is that this field looks a little bit, actually a lot, like that of a of a bar magnet like this that's kind of been squished, like a really short bar magnet, right, with the two poles like this. Get that same same kind of shape. Um, in all cases, I need to have a current that's just flowing, right? It is a solenoid. It's another kind of thing um, where the difference now is the difference between a solenoid and a coil. Like when a coil, I just wrap it around kind of the same place like a hundred times. In a solenoid, I I wrap it and I you know slowly move over. So it's kind of like you might take a spring that's, that's close together, right? Um, not stretched, but a just a, a little spring or something might have that kind of shape, like a sort of spiral, this helix. Um, if I run a current through it, I'm going to get a magnetic field that looks like this. It's fairly constant in the center and fairly weak outside it and kind of strongish here and here. Um, you might want to compare this to the field from a simple bar magnet, which I went to in in chapter, um, sorry, in part two of, of this video series. Right. So that actually looks very much like a bar magnet. You can imagine if I have a switch in here, I can turn this magnet on and off. Like if I imagine I put a little little switch in here, you know about switches, so here's my switch, um, it's open, no current is flowing, it's turned off, if I close it, it's going to get turned on, so what I've built here is a little electromagnet, right, so by, by an electromagnet, um, in this case an electromagnet that resembles a bar magnet, in this case I'd have an electromagnet if I have a switch for this one where I turn the current on and off, to resemble this kind of shape. Now, um, let me go on, a, before I go to the next page that I've prepared, let me go on a little detour here. Um, these, li these kinds of magnets, these kind of loops, imagine I put a whole bunch of them, right? So I put a loop like this, a loop, a loop here, a loop here, and all these loops. Let's pretend they're all aligned. The magnetic fields are going to add up. Let me say I've got more, and just wrote a couple more. So those loops, they're aligned. Like lots and lots and lots and lots of little loops. The magnetic fields in each case are sort of going to be like this, right? It's almost like they're each a little, little bar magnet with the north pole to the right. If they're all aligned the same way. So that's how they add up to create an overall magnetic field that would look, look something like this. Now, do we have such little, little loops of current? at the atomic level, like what's causing the current there? Well, if you look at an atom, say, right, here's my atom, it's my nucleus, and then there are electrons going around it. Well, if you imagine there's an electron that sort of goes around like this, I shouldn't have used, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used um, blue there, blue I've been using for the magnetic field, imagine this is the path of an electron, it goes like this, well, because it's negative, the field's the other way around, right? It keeps going round and round and round and round. So that's like a continuous current flowing. If you're standing by the side of this loop here and you watch electron go around, you can count charge passing you per second, even if it's the same electron over and over and over. So this is actually going to create an electric field, much like much like one of those. Right, it's on the atomic scale. So each atom, at least once with an odd number of electrons and in certain states, let's not worry about that, but each atom can effectively function as a small tiny magnet. We say um, the atom has a magnetic moment. And now if all those atoms align with their magnetic moments, then they're going to add up to form an overall magnet and you might have a bunch of group of those and each of those groups will form one of those domains that I talked about in the video on permanent magnets. Right? The iron nail that's made out of lots of tiny little domains, each one's a little magnet, but each of those domains is kind of a group of those, they're sort of aligned with each other but maybe not the neighboring group of, of atoms over here. But if they're all brought into alignment, then I'm going to get an overall magnetic field. And so permanent magnets are made up of lots of tiny little current loops 
around each atom. Right? And if they all align, in certain conditions have to be true for that to be the case. You know, not all materials do it. Only very few actually do it so consistently. Um, but if they do align, I get an overall magnetic field made up of lots of tiny little ones of those, each one um, from an electron circling an atom. And so I'm going to get an overall magnetic field. And because electrons don't go anywhere, they just hang out and, you know, spin. Like, stop the spin too, but they, they go in a, in a loop around the, um, the atom. I'll end up with a permanent magnetic field, right, that is created by tiny little currents made up of single electrons going around the atom a stupid number of times per second. So permanent magnets are really just lots of tiny little current loops. And current loops or current um, moving current, right, currents, moving charges are really the only source of magnetic fields. The compass needle seems to create a magnetic field, or the, um, the bar magnet that creates a magnetic field, is, is really just a well-arranged group of those tiny little um, atomic, um, atomic current loops. All right, now let me, uh, let me put this away. Let me come to the next, and uh, the next segment now, which is the, the Biosavar law. So I gave you a couple of equations for some of those um, arrangements of, of, of wires, um, currents, they have a long straight wire or a loop or a solenoid. Um, but all of those are ultimately derived from this law here. Now this law is somewhat, I want to say it's complicated to apply. Like with everything, if you've done it a couple of times, it becomes, you know, you know how to do it. It's not impossibly complicated. Um, but you probably have to spend a little bit of time on it, applying it to get used to it. So here's how this, this works. So the Biosalva law fundamentally gives me the magnetic field created by a single moving charge. Right? Remember, magnetic fields affect moving charges. They create forces on that. And I'm going to talk about that in the next video in part four. But a moving charge, you know, a proton flying by me, that creates a, a magnetic field and it creates a magnetic field that is given by this equation let's understand what this equation says so first of all the strength of the magnetic field is given by mu naught this constant this magnetic constant over 4 pi the constant mu naught is called the permeability of free space um, i mean that's just what it is. I'm not sure I can say anything about that. Remember the epsilon node in electrostatic is called the permittivity of free space. I don't know who came up with those names. Right, but that's what it's called. So mu node is, is given by this value. Um, the units is, is in tesla meters per amp. And I, I haven't really said this yet, but the unit of the magnetic field is the tesla. The unit of B field is the Tesla T. Um, and one Tesla is actually a really strong magnetic field. So often, um, if you have like a magnet in your hands, it has, you know, uh, micro Teslas or milli Teslas maybe, but definitely not Teslas. Right? That's something you can create in a specialized lab maybe. Um, um, but there are natural processes where you have really strong magnetic fields, but they're usually out in space. Um, you know, neutron stars have huge magnetic fields often. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of stuff that we deal with on Earth, a Tesla would be an extremely strong magnetic field. So we have this constant here. Then we multiply it by the, the charge. Right, The charge is flying half a coulomb, one millicoulomb, two nanocoulombs, you name it, um, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, whatever it is, that's the value. So that part is easy. Now, we multiply it by the velocity of the particle as a vector, right, cross product with the 
unit vector in the direction to where you want to find the um, the magnetic field. So here's a drawing. Imagine the particle is right here and it's moving to the right. If it's moving some other direction, you can always pretend I'm turning my, my paper, right? So that it's moving to the right. Let's suppose I want to find the magnetic field up here. Then V is this vector here. R is the distance between the, where the particle is and where I'm trying to calculate the field. And this thing up here, that vector R here, R hat, now I drew it R arrow hat, but I think often it's just written as R with just a hat on. Um, that is the vector that's in the direction of where, they, where I want to find the field, but of length 1. Right, a unit vector means length one. So unit vector. Um, I'm going to use blue here. The unit vector has length one. So it's really just a matter of um, direction. So the cross product is the thing that maybe you've met it in some calculus course it's not inherently a calculus concept there's nothing like differentiation or integration about it right it, it's but it's sort of a slightly more advanced vector concept um, so I'm going to talk about it in just a second but the crucial thing about the vector product is it takes two vectors you multiply two vectors together I mean don't not literally multiply you take two vectors as input and the cross product spits out a new vector third one. And that vector is perpendicular to both the input vectors. So it's inherently a 3D concept, right? If I've got two, uh, two vectors and I want a third one that's perpendicular to both, it has to be in the third dimension. Um, I'll show that picture to you in, in a second. But if you're sort of troubled by that, you know, there's another convenient way that sometimes is easier to, to calculate. Um, where we rewrite the, the cross product as the rewrite the Bia Savalo in this form here. So mu over for pi, q it's easy. One over r squared, again that should be easy in general. You just got to calculate what the distance is. Um, and then we've got v, the speed, never mind direction, times the sine of this angle between the that vector and and the direction where they get the, the point is where you want to calculate the field. Um, that gives you the magnitude of the field here. And then the direction is determined by the right hand rule. It's not the right hand curly rule from earlier, but a different right hand rule. So let me explain this to you now. Um, before I do, let me say there's another version of this for a small segment of, um, of wire which says this, the, um, this is going to side, I'm going to squeeze it in here, B for a small wire segment, and that's what you'd use to actually calculate the total magnetic field created, say, due to a current loop, right, you'd sort of take an individual little segment um, and then add up the segments, probably by integration. That is given by, it looks kind of the same, but instead of Q times V, I have the current times the um, a short distance along the wire. Let's call it delta S cross R hat right by R squared. So this way you replace the charge times its speed by the current times the length of your little segment. Um, so that's how you'd get back, for example, the 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 thing I showed you earlier, um, this this expression here, how you'd actually worked it out. What is the magnetic field here? I take a tiny segment of my loop, figure out the magnetic field due to the segment, add the magnetic field to the next segment, the next segment, next magnetic segment, add them all up um, in the center. That's done by integration, but each individual segment gives me the magnetic field um, given by this. Um, it, it, you can sort of check that that's essentially the same, at least in terms of units, right, charge times distance per time is charge per time times distance, right, I delta S is the same units as Q, um, QV, this is a kind of sanity check that this um, is a plausible, 
suppose is the thing. Of course, we can justify it um, fully by thinking about what is current in terms of moving charges and so on. But let's actually um, get a little bit more to grips with the, the cross product. I'm not going to explicit examples here, but I'm trying to try to understand it in more detail. So here's the vector cross product. And you have to think in 3D. The vector cross product does not work in 2D. Right? The dot product that works in 2D, you take the dot product into vectors, it gives you just a number. You can take it, you know, with two vectors that I can literally draw on a page. Not here. So here I try to kind of draw it in 3D, right? If we're two vectors A and B, and I wanna I wanna take the cross product between them. In the case of the Bio Savalo, A would be the um, velocity, right? So um, let me just add this. This would be the velocity, and I'm going to cross it with this uh, hat vector. And then I get, after multiplying it by some other constant, it would give me the B field. So the vector I get from the cross product is going to be perpendicular to the first two. So in this case, I sort of try to draw A and B in a in a plane, like sort of sitting on the ground, maybe something like, you imagine it's a sheet of paper like this, they're in, inside a sheet of paper, and then C sticks straight up. So literally, it would be like um, A, B, C. Right, that's the picture we're trying to visualize here. Now, there's a way to calculate the, cro the cross product from the components. Um, and the way to do this, I'm going to actually show you in, in just a second. The, the length of this vector is given by the length of this one, the absolute value, the magnitude, right? Magnitude of this times the magnitude of this. And then you multiply it by the sine of the angle between them. So what that means is the smaller the angle between them, right, the, the closer those two are together like this, the smaller the resulting C would, would be. If they're like this, bigger angle, C is going to be sticking out more, it's going to be bigger. Um, if A and B are in the same direction, then the angle is zero, and so if they're parallel, the angle is zero, so the whole thing is zero. The cross product of two vectors pointing the same direction or in opposite directions is zero. Um, if they're 90 degrees to each other, A and B, that's when the sine of theta is the biggest, equal to 1. So I just get a the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times 1. Um, the direction of C, so there are two directions it could point, right? If it's perpendicular to A and B, it could point up or it could point down. In the 3D, it could point out of the page or into the page. Which is it? That's where the right-hand rule comes in. So the right-hand rule is you take your right hand and you take your first three fingers and your thumb, your index finger and your middle finger. If you're a violinist, you call this the first finger, well, get over it. Um, if you're a pianist, you call this the first finger, good for you. Um, I like violinists, by the way. Um, but not a point. One, two, three. That's the easy way to remember. And I just go one, two, three. Now, you hold your fingers like this, or 90 degrees to each other, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, um, there's only one way you can point those. Like you can't, your middle finger can't possibly point down if I align my thumb with A and B. Let me see if I can do this, sort of like this, A and B, like this, right? There's only one way the middle finger can point. It can't point down into the page unless I break my finger joint, which I'm not going to do. Um, that's how you get the direction of that, right? It's kind of the easiest way to remember is which, which finger is which. And there are all sorts of rules they try to peddle you with like, oh, this is the force, this is the... F I don't even know, right? No, no, think of this way. A cross B is C. A cross B is C. And if those two are not at 90 degrees but an angle, well, this still has to point the same way as before. Um, it just make the magnitude smaller. That takes some practice applying, and I expect when it comes to, say, the, the exam, you'll be sitting there, you know, trying to do weird gymnastics with your hand. Um, I once was in, in the classroom teaching this stuff, and I was doing a sample problem, and I kept getting the direction wrong. This didn't make sense. And this is, um, so I was trying to, like, apply the rules. 
until I figured out I was using my left hand to do the right hand rule. And not advisable, use your right hand for the right hand rule. If, um, one word of caution, if the charge is negative, such an electron, it will flip the direction because you're multiplying the vector by a, by a negative number that will change the direction effectively. Um, this takes some practice. So let's just, just once more look at it at the some of the implications for the Biot-Savart law. The Biot-Savart uh, law has V cross R in it, plus times some constants, right? So if 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 I care about a point that's right in front of my charge, so my charge here moving this way, if I care about this point here, my R vector would look like this, right? It would be R, the weight direction, and R hat would be just the length one vector in that direction. The angle between them is zero. The angle is zero. There is zero magnetic field here. If you're here, if you want to know about this point, there's going to be some field, um, some field here, because this R here is at an angle to this one here, to the V. The angle is going to be biggest if you go just sort of above and below or like left and right of the direction of motion. So not forwards or backwards. Then this is 90 degrees, and that means the sine is this maximum. Um, now in this case, if let's apply, let's say I want to know what's the direction of the field here. I'd say, okay, velocity, R, right? So velocity is my thumb that goes to the right. R, the direction of the, the point where I want to figure out what the field is, is in this case up the page. So the middle finger has to stick straight up. And I obviously can't perfectly do this, but you know, I can be close enough. Um, so the field here is coming upwards out of the page. If I go down here, what about down here? Um, well, velocity is still this way, but now R points down like this. Velocity to the right, uh, R down. So my middle finger can only point downwards into the page. So I need to draw here, I draw a dot. The field comes, that means the field comes out of the page. Here I draw a cross, the field goes into the page. Here, uh, I don't know what I'm drawing here, but there's no field there. So it, it's sort of like the field is um, coming out of the page when you are above it. It's coming out of the page, strongest here, weakest if you're sort of right in front or behind, um, and goes into the page to the to the right and sort of curls around like this. All right, it's kind of just these loops of of, a, of magnetic field that are strongest just left and right of the charge. The, the magnitude itself, okay, it's kind of the easy part. Um, you, just, you know, multiply all those values, figure out the distance. The direction is the thing that takes some practice. There are some homework problems um, on that that you're going to be dealing with. Now, just for completeness, if you want to figure, actually calculate the, the cross product as from components, right? So from um, from from magnitudes and angles, you can do it this way. But maybe you just have the vector and components, and you're like, how do I find the angle? Well, to find the angle between two vectors, you could use the cross product, actually, or you could use dot product and find the angle. Um, never mind all that. If you have two vectors in components, x and y components, the way to do this would be as follows. So I'm going to write, say, a, right, is given by ax, ay, az. I'm going to write in this column form for vectors. B bx, by, bz. Then a cross b, well it's going to be ax, ay, az, the components crossed with bx, by, bz. So here's how you do it. The answer is going to be a vector with three components. Right. So two vectors make one vector. To figure out the x component, I cover up the x component of those, and I go crosswise. I go this times this minus this times this. A, Y, B, Z minus A, Z, B, Y. Right. It's kind of like a cross like this. To figure out the y component, I cover out cover up the y direction of the original vectors, and I I start. 
Um, we always cross y is one multiplication minus the other way. I always start just as in a way the next one down. So a z b x minus a x b z. To find this, the so this would be sort of like like this and this. To find the um, the z component of this vector, I cover up the z direction here. And now the next one down, I just go back to the top, ax, ax, b, y, minus a, y, b, x. So it's always, uh, you always go like ax, b, y, a, y, b, x, um, a, y, b, z, a, z, b, y. The only one you have to be careful of with in the middle is because there you sort of go from bottom to top first, then from top to bottom. Um, I think of it as I imagine I just, I just start one below what's covered up and go sort of it, it like loops around. So I go from here down to here. You can always imagine like some kind of they're like on a wheel and I cover up the top one and then when I want the next component I just move those we I like turn those wheels so the 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 X goes to the bottom. Um, you just have to do it a couple of times and find your own way to to make sense of it. Now. How on earth is this equal to this? Or how is the magnitude of this thing equal to this? And why does it give me this right-hand rule? Like, why should those things be the same thing? I'm going to leave that to your to your math classes to tell you. Um, it will just be a, a waste of time right now. But I hope that setting this up helps. We're going to need to cross product again in part 4 where we calculate the... Um, the, the forces on moving charges. And the only way you're going to learn this is just by practicing. Thinking about it, sure, but in also just putting in practice. All right, that's it for part three. We talked about how magnetic, how uh, moving charges, um, either by themselves or in wires, create magnetic fields. In part four, I'm going to discuss the effect that magnetic fields have on moving charges that are traveling through them. Kind of going the other way. I'll see you there.